Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff. I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you from my home on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people here in Nisquimo. In this series, we are talking with staff at the museum who've been asked to work from home about their work and research. May is Invasive Species Awareness Month. An invasive species is defined as plants and animals not native to BC or outside of their natural distribution area and may negatively impact BC's environment, people, and economy. To talk more about this today, we have the Royal BC Museum's Curator of Vertebrate Zoology, Dr. Gavin Hankey. After working at the Manitoba Museum and teaching in universities, Gavin came to the Royal BC Museum in 2004. In addition to a particular interest in fish and paleoichthyology, Gavin also has an interest in exotic species and invasive animals and the role of the pet trade in those introductions. Gavin, when did you first notice that the pet trade had an impact on invasive species introductions? Uh, that actually happened just before I started my master's degree. Um, the, there was a pet store in Winnipeg that brought in a pile of minnows that they were selling for pond fish for people's gardens. And that species, I did a quick look up on it and it's highly invasive. And that was my first clue. And uh, just reporting that fish got me noticed and got me started on my master's, which was on an invasive bass in Lake Winnipeg. Mm, so you're familiar with the bass <laughs> from early days. Different bass, actually, white bass. <laughs> White bass. Okay, great. So you have a presentation for us to tell us more about the invasive species that we'll find here in BC. You can go ahead and start sharing that screen if you like. Okie doke. Is that working? I want you, I see me twice, which is lovely, but a little strange. So we want to get your um, PowerPoint on the main screen. That's interesting. Okay. Is there it Did is. that work? Yes, now Yay. it's entered. Great. Okay, doke. That looks good. Does it look good to everyone? Looking good. Okay. So yeah, basically I've been interested in the, the pet trade for decades and keeping an eye on it for species that pose a risk to the environment in not just British Columbia, but Canada. Uh, there are some animals that come into the pet stores that could impact even colder places like I grew up in Winnipeg and there were species coming across the border that could survive even there. But BC, well, I should say before I moved here, I used to joke that I didn't have BC's problem uh, because we knew that thing, a lot more organisms could survive here because this, this part of BC is so much warmer in winter. But anyway, uh, I moved here in 2004, so now BC's problem is my problem, and the joke's on me. Uh, and so I started to look at pets here as a, as a form of pollution, uh, pets that could threaten our ecosystem. Now you can see in this starting photo, photo there's, a, there's a snake and it's a California king snake. I'll highlight this one a little further on, but this photo was actually taken in British Columbia. It's a species that's found south of us, but shouldn't be actually here in BC. So now I'm part of a group called IMISWIG, which is a terrible acronym for Inv Inter-Ministry Invasive Species Working Group. And we have this um, program, let me hide that little share screen thing. Um, basically it's a don't let it loose program. And you'll see these stickers or little posters at pet stores around the province. And it's basically to remind people that if you've got a pet, look after it or find it a new home if you decide you don't want it anymore. The, the pet trade, regardless of how much we try, they, well, they do import things that could survive here and some animals could that they do import could spread far and wide. Plants also get imported that are a serious risk to BC and I'll highlight one of those a little bit later. So now, I guess the big question is, are we polluted by people's pets? And the fact is, yes. This, uh, this, these two fish, I mean, the one in the, at the bottom, the orange one, that's an Oscar. It's an albino form or a close to albino form. That was caught in Shimanus. A, a young guy was fishing and he saw it. So he cast his fishing lure over towards it. And sure enough, the Oscar bit and he reeled it in. We now have that fish at the museum, but that's a South American fish. It should not be in BC. So obviously someone just dumped their pet. They got sick of it. They let it go. Uh, the flower horn, which is the one in the, the, the upper photo, that was found in Kelowna. Now, it was found dead, 
So I don't know if it just couldn't survive there or not, but it's an example of people dumping a, a quite a sizable fish into a, a creek there. The funny thing is, is the flower horn doesn't actually live in the wild anywhere. It's a man-made hybrid that's very popular and very expensive in the pet trade. Uh, so I'm kind of shocked that someone would let that go. You could probably get $300 for that fish. Um, so kind of stunning that it was, it was just dumped into the wild. But it does show that these animals are intentionally released. It's not always accidental. Here on the island, we've had a blue-eyed Placostomus. It's an algae-eating fish from South America. That was found in Shawnigan Lake years ago. We've had Paku, which are basically vegetarian piranha, and they are again in Nanaimo. Two, I think two of those were caught back then. And then last year, we had piranha caught in Nanaimo. And there are occasional reports of piranha dumped into other lakes here and there in British Columbia, but no real solid evidence. The piranhas that were in Nanaimo were actually caught on hook and line, so we actually had those specimens. They eventually will come down to the museum when isolation opens up, and I'll, I'll either drive up to get them myself or they'll be delivered. So it'll be good to get those as concrete proof of a pet store animal being dumped into BC. Gavin, did you now, say the Paku was a um, vegetarian piranha? Yeah, they basically eat um, plant material for the most part. They'll accidentally eat invertebrates, maybe some fish eggs or something on plants, but a lot they, they basically are fruit and uh, plant eating. Oh, and do they have the same yeah. sort of teeth that make piranha so distinctive? Nope, their teeth are more like incisors and, and oh. they're almost peg-like for, for plucking and scraping up plants. Yeah, they're, they're quite different. Body-wise, the, the shape of them is very similar. And they're big, like they're, they're dinner plate size without a doubt. So these are not tiny fish. So, but then the thing about these guys is they're all tropical. These are South American fish. So British Columbia, even in the summer, our lakes are really not warm enough for them. They might survive a season, but they certainly wouldn't survive winters here. So in that respect, it's not too bad that they were here. The real risk that I worry about is disease because there are diseases in fishes in the pet trade that could infect local mm. fish. And we certainly don't want that. This is a fish that's thriving in the Alouette River system. It's a weather loach. This is actually one that I photographed from a pet store here in Victoria. Now, loaches, this specific type of loach is kind of eel shaped and people buy them to live with their pet goldfish because they can handle cooler water. These have been here since 2008, or at least they were first found in 2008, and there's now multiple age classes. So this species is now breeding and spreading in the Alouette River system in BC, that's on the lower mainland. So there's a great example of something that could get even more invasive uh, as it acclimates to our climate. But it's certainly a species from Eurasia that can handle cooler conditions. And it, it basically found a really nice, nice habitat on the lower mainland. Now, this is a fish from Canada. And you find they're also in the US, but I mean, the fathead minnow is found east of us across Canada and they survive, well, they survive Manitoba winters. And having been through a few of those, I know how tough that can be. Um, what you get in the pet stores here in British Columbia is a form that we call the rosy red minnow. And people buy them to feed their piranhas or feed their oscars or other predatory fish, maybe even turtles. And sometimes the people put them in their garden ponds and if the pond floods, then the fish get released. And we've now got small populations. Como Lake is particularly rich with them. In fact, when it first broke the news, people thought they were goldfish and so I had to correct the identification. But it's a minnow and people think, well, whoopie doo, it's a minnow. But when a minnow is so abundant that the lake shore looks orange, it's, it's a species that's seriously disrupting the original habitat that was present in the lake. Uh, even Bouchard Gardens have them in their, their uh, water features. And I've seen them at golf courses. And this year we got breaking news. Um, the Rose Valley Park in West Kelowna. Also, I got an email saying, can you identify these goldfish? And I said, well, first off, they're not goldfish. 
And you can see that ruler there. Sorry, it's the old measurement system. It's not, uh, not metric. But uh, it's not a big fish. It's not, that's not even two inches, really, is it? They're not huge, but it's a fish that shouldn't be here. And you can, they found schools of them in the, in the ditches in this park. And so there's a species from outside of British Columbia that if left unchecked, could spread far and wide. Now, what's gonna happen with these guys is predatory birds are gonna attack and the colorful ones will get picked off and they'll probably revert back to more of a wild coloration, which is what you saw in the previous slide. But this is certainly a fish we don't want here. We don't want anything from the pet trade because of the disease risk, number one. But number two, they're, they're not supposed to be here, so they, they shouldn't be released. Uh, about a two, two weeks after I got the original report, I got an email with another report from the same area. And they'd looked carefully, and if you can see in that photograph of the fish swimming, there's four goldfish. So mixed in with those rosy red minnows were goldfish, which is making me think someone had a pond full of fish that they dumped in this park. So now there's two species from the pet trade in this one area. And as far as I know, they're gonna go in there insane or electrofish to try to remove them all. And I certainly hope they're successful. But uh, you can see from what could have only been a handful of fish, there's, there's easily 80 to 100 fish just in these few photographs. But we're not limited to fish. We've got bullfrogs and green frogs. Now, these came in via the pet parade as tadpoles. So when you go buy goldfish at a pet store, sometimes you'll see tadpoles mixed in with them and people raise them up because it's kind of fun to watch. And then the bullfrog or the green frog adult outgrows the interest of the owner and people let them go. And bullfrogs, to be honest, are terrible pets because they jump so far, they end up banging their nose on the cage and they get hurt and it's terrible to see. So I, I think people take pity on them and let them go. Um, they've also been here uh, from sources outside of the pet trade, but certainly the pet trade is a source of, of these large frogs. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see a fire belly toad. This was actually my pet, because um, I, I didn't have a photograph of the one that we found loose in Victoria. But even these guys are common in the pet trade, and I got a report of at least one in a pond in Victoria. I didn't get to catch the one that was in Victoria. The, the guy who owned the pond said he didn't want it killed. So I wasn't, I wasn't given the location, but uh, I don't know if this frog survived any or firebelly toad survived any long, how, or how long it survived, but it's certainly an example of a, of a pet loose in BC. Mm. Gavin, yeah. before you leave the frogs, um, you mentioned that the American bullfrogs have come in part from the pet trade, but that there's other sources yeah. as well. I've heard a a common story, maybe it's not true, um, that there had been somebody on the island who thought they would introduce them as a, as a food source, like for people to exactly. eat, and it just wasn't popular, so they let them go as well. Is that is that a true story? That is that is one of the stories, but they've also migrated north in BC from Washington State, okay. and one of the more re recent populations uh, is in south of, um, I want to say Creston off the top of my off the top of my head and it's moving north which is threatening and that that invasion north is is threatening some of our last remnants of leopard frog habitat so um so they're in they're invading from multiple sources now i've, I've had pet turtles ever since i was in kindergarten to be honest with you and my first one was a red-eared slider I, I was given a snake and my mom said if I get rid of the snake, she'd buy me a turtle. So I got the turtle. We moved to Winnipeg. They put it in the baggage car of the train and it froze to death in January. And so then I collected painted turtles and snapping turtles. And so I've, I've had a long history with turtles. Uh, BC has a long history with turtles as well. Uh, when red-eared sliders get too big, people let them go. But it's not the only turtle found here in BC. Uh, red-eared sliders now are actually able to breed in BC, so we've, we're getting our summers are long enough that the eggs are surviving to hatch. And two of the turtles I have at home are ones from the first nest that was uh, successful in hatching in uh, on the lower mainland. I've also caught yellow belly sliders, which is it's the same species as the red slider. It's a different subspecies, but those are in the pet trade. 
the yellow belly slider in this uh, image, that was actually from uh, Beacon Hill Park, but they are found elsewhere. People dump their pets. And uh, so, so they are certainly around, but so far turtle reproduction is, is pretty low. And so most of the invasion is from people dumping pets. So if people would stop doing that, the populations would eventually dwindle. Now, having said that, they can easily live 20 years. So it's a long-term invasion. And it's, granted, turtles aren't the fastest to invade, but they would be here for a while. Uh, the soft-shell turtles, it looks like that, that sort of green speckled pancake in the, the bottom left, that was, one of those was found near Stanley Park. So someone had, again, dumped one. They are particularly nasty turtles as pets. I've been bitten by them and it is not nice. They've got incredible jaw strength and tiny little mouths so that they put a lot of pressure on a very small place. It's like, it's like being bitten with needle nose pliers. Um, they are banned from importation, but every now and again, I do see them in the pet stores. And obviously this one that was in uh, Stanley Park was a release. Luckily, they are not breeding here. Snapping turtles, on the other hand, I'm not sure about. Um, there are persistent reports of snapping turtles on Vancouver Island, and I wonder if there isn't a small population. Uh, I, I do get reports fairly regularly from conservation officers who've, who've seen them or caught them, and we do have a few specimens at the museum now because of the people dumping their pets. And every now and again, people do admit to me that they've got them. And I just, I just, you know, beg them not to release it. A snapping turtle, to give you an idea, um, they can easily, well, much larger, like almost the size of a turkey platter for shell. They're, they're, I mean, a good sized one is bigger than a dinner plate, but they get much larger than that. Uh, my dad and I saw one once, just its head was poking up and breathing. I actually thought it was a tree stump and I was going to tie my canoe to it. And then it ducked and swam away. So these things get huge. Yeah. And I have been bitten by a 15 pounder. It is excruciatingly painful. Um, so this is not something we want in BC. And an adult snapping turtle can eat a trout whole. I've wow. seen it. So this is not an animal we want loose in British Columbia. Gavin, is that common snapping turtle, is that found in Eastern Canada? Um, is it yeah. native to any yeah, part of Canada? They're native to Eastern Canada. They, I, don't think they they might make it into Saskatchewan, but it would be just very limited. Uh, but they do they are in Manitoba and further east. There's another group of turtles here, and we haven't done a really good survey of them yet. And these are the map turtles. I think there's three species here. There's definitely two species, and these are again all pets that have been dumped. They haven't made it here on their own. Uh, there's a few records in the Okanagan. There's at least one at Beacon Hill Park. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I know, I know we've got two, but I think there are three here. And there's a, a colleague of mine is writing a report on pet turtles in British Columbia. I can't wait to see what he comes up with as his final report to see what, what species he's identified here. But again, shouldn't be here, just someone released them. Gavin, is that, sorry, is that map turtle, um, is that full size, that in that image we saw, oh, is no. it a fairly small turtle? Oh, no. So that's, that's kind that of what was, happens. Nope. People really like the little cute ones, and then they keep growing. Yeah, I, I, put, I put the hatchling in because they're so darn cute. Um, yeah. Full size is about the size of a dinner plate, so they are sizable turtles. Now, we also have snakes, and most people... When you say there's snakes loose, people start to get twitchy and jumpy. It's almost as bad as when people say they've seen a spider. Um, now, luckily, snakes are not kept in massive numbers. So if they get loose, it's one at a time and very unlikely that they would start a breeding population. But there's always a risk of mites or ticks or diseases that could transfer to our native snakes. That's, that's what worries me with snakes getting loose in BC. Uh, corn snakes, rat snakes, they, they certainly do appear here from time to time. Generally, they appear where people are, so you'll find them in cities. We've had them in Victoria. They've probably been in Okanagan or maybe Vancouver. The California king snake was found near Penticton. And I hate to say, I, I don't want to sound ungrateful. It was It's great to get that photo as documentation of the species here, but I sure wish they would have grabbed it because if they got that close to take that photograph, they should have been able to get a handle on it. Um, it would have been neat to sample some DNA from that snake and figure out where it came from. 
they're not venomous and they can actually, I think, I'm not sure if all king snakes, but king snakes can eat rattlesnakes. So we don't want that loose in British Columbia eating our rattlesnakes. Some people might like that, but rattlesnakes are part of our environment and they should be protected. On the large end, we also get pythons and boas released in BC. We've had a large Burmese python found between Duncan and Shawnigan Lake. Now it was found dead, so I don't know if someone just dumped a dead body or the snake was alive for a little while and then died it, alongside a road, it's hard to tell. But that was at least a nine foot snake, if I can remember correctly. We've had spotted pythons found in Victoria. And again, these are one at a time. These are, there's no way we're gonna have a population. Boa constrictors, the, the most recent boa that I know of was uh, released around Christina Lake in the interior. And it was caught, so it's now removed from the ecosystem. I requested it for the museum, but uh, the natural resource of officers preferred to keep it alive. So uh, it went to a brand new home somewhere in the interior. So that's fine. Um, ball pythons also, they're popular pets, but when they outlive the interest of their owners, they get released as well. So we've had at least five or six ball pythons loose in BC. They certainly wouldn't survive here. It's just too cold, but you certainly don't want them here. Lizards, of course, we, they're popular pets. We've had bearded dragons here in Victoria. There was one years ago found in Okanagan Falls. These guys are a warm climate animal. They will not survive here. It's not good for the lizard. Now this, this poor lizard, I don't know if you can really see it in the photo, but his backbone is almost visible along his back because he's so skinny and his eyes are sunk in. He was not doing very well outside, loose in BC. Um, but it's again, it's something that should not have been released or has been. I think sometimes people have them out in the garden just because they'd like it to get some sunshine and then they forget that when lizards are warm, they can really run and they get away. This is probably the case for a green iguana that was found in Oak Bay last year, or at least was reported released. I can't remember if they actually found it or not. But you know, an iguana, easily the, the length of an adult human, if you tackle it and grab it, you're gonna get some claw marks on you. They've got pretty strong claws, they can bite, and they can whip you with their tail. So they're they're not a pleasant customer if they're not if it's not a lizard that's used to being handled. Um, certainly not something you'd want loose in BC. They would never survive here, of course. They are introduced to Florida. And so um, if you're in a warmer part of the world, this could become an invasive species. And hopefully climate change will never get to the point where they, these guys could invade here. But again, one animal at a time released in BC. We've had geckos that arrived from Hawaii in shipments to uh, CFB Comox. They phoned me up and asked how to get rid of them. And I just said, open your doors. It sounded kind of sarcastic, but really it's so cold here, especially when these geckos arrived, that all they needed to do was cool down their warehouse and the lizards would not survive. So um, that was an easy one to, to circumvent. But some geckos in Hawaii are all female. They don't need a male to reproduce. And so, you don't need a large number of them to start a population. Females produce clones of themselves. And so a small founding population can start an invasion if the climate was acceptable to them. The last few years, we've been getting several anoles. These are brown anoles in snake plants and other tropical plants at Home Depot, Home Hardware. Um, I don't know if Canadian Tires had them but there's been repeated reports of little lizards hatching out and they're imported as eggs in the soil of the plant pots. And so one at a time, these lizards are making their way north into Canada. Uh, most of them get caught and they wouldn't survive here, but it wouldn't take too much of a climate change to get these guys to survive in, in little warm pockets here in British Columbia. I think probably on Southern Vancouver Island, they might actually be able to get a toehold. So um, certainly when people find these, I tell them to keep them as pets because they're charming little pets. Um, you feed them crickets, things like that in a nice terrarium and they fan out their throat and put on some fancy displays. But it's just showing how easy it is to introduce something as large as a lizard just as an egg in a plant pot. It's, it's so easy to have these things get around the planet. Yeah, and snake They're plants actually introduced been... a... Oh, sorry, sorry. I was just gonna say snake plants uh, kind of had a popularity 
boost uh, earlier yeah. this year, late last year. We got one. Now I'm going to yeah. have to look around for this um, anole just to be sure. Yeah, my, my wife and I have one and I wouldn't mind more because they're really easy maintenance. Um, the nice thing about anole is because they're a, a tree dwelling lizard, they don't lay a large bunch of eggs at once. So the ovaries on the left and right side of the female will alternate egg production. So they're only producing one egg at a time. So when it lays an egg, it's only one. So hopefully it's only one egg in each pot and the pot goes to a different place. So you're not gonna end up with a population. It's not like 10 lizards are gonna hatch out of a pot. Uh, usually it's only one. So we have at least that going for us. And this is the lizard that's gone far and wide in British Columbia. At the top is the common wall lizard and you can see all these dots in orange are records where we have them. This map is actually old. We've got them in Comox, Crofton, um, they're all up and down the west side. They're spreading on Denman Island. We've got a second record from Vancouver. Luckily, the records in Summerland and the Soyuz are, are gone. The, a handful of them were taken to uh, Summerland in 1983, if I remember correctly, and that population died out. And then the Soyuz record was a single lizard that stowed away in a shipment of grapes from Vancouver Island, and they caught it, and it's now gone, so at least is not surviving there. The red dots, whoops, sorry, let me go back, whoop, back one. The red dots on this map, it's a completely different species. It's the Italian wall lizard. And so our common wall lizard has, the green on the back is, is interrupted by all kinds of blotches. The Italian wall lizard has this, at least this subspecies, has really clean stripes down the back. And the belly on the Italian wall lizard is white or creamy white, so it's easy to tell from our common wall lizards. The common wall lizard, or sorry, the Italian wall lizard has been established on Orcas Island for probably 12 years now, and nobody reported it until recently. And we, last year, we got one Italian wall lizard in Vancouver. So luckily it was a, it was a female, and we haven't seen any hatchlings in the area, so we assumed she didn't lay any eggs. And that one, Vancouver record is now at the museum, so it's out of the ecosystem. But it does show these things are easy to transport and once they're established, it's pretty much impossible to eradicate them. So that's why with invasive species, you either attack them early when, they're first, when they first arrive or prevent them being released in the first place. And prevention is the, the easiest way to avoid the invasion. Now, when I'm looking around for lizards, and I'm always doing this, I don't often see the lizards themselves. Quite often I see their poop. And down here, this is lizard poop. It's distinctive. It's not like bird poop. There's a little bit of uric acid and then the crunched up insect shells in the, the part I always tell people it looks like a raisin. Um, sorry if you like raisins. But the lizard poop is distinctive and it tells, and that tells me that there are lizards in the area. And if it's in Victoria here or in uh, suburban settings, I just assume it's a wall lizard because uh, alligator lizards don't do so well around, around people. And of course, alligator lizards are our native species. But sometimes you also find skin. So that tells you that a lizard was there not that long ago because the skin won't last too long in the environment. But wall lizards, as far as I'm concerned, are the perfect invasive species. And they were originally released when a private zoo, well, two of them were released in 1967. This guy just let them go. And then another 12 or so were released in 1970 as a, when a private zoo closed down. So these were effectively pets that were let loose. And if we'd have eradicated them in, 19, in the early 70s, we'd have cleared this population out. But these guys are the perfect invader. They're, they're aggressive. They live in urban or disturbed habitat. So basically they love where we live. They reproduce at a young age. They produce possibly two to three clutches of eggs a year. They eat anything they can find. I just recently got a photograph of one eating a bumblebee so they can tackle some pretty large insects. And uh, they came from a climate in North Central Italy that's much like our climate. So they're, this, is, this was the perfect place for them to land. Now the other problem is I, I've sort of hinted to it with, with pets as, a, as invaders is the other things that can happen as a result of their introduction. So uh, African clawed frogs are one of the, were, are basically 
um, proposed as the introduction, as the, the vector introducing chytrid fungus to North America. So pets or animals in captivity can transmit diseases. They can bring mites, worms. Uh, yeah, so, so parasites and disease is a, is a real risk with pets. The ecological shifts, once things invade and they upturn the ecosystem, you can never turn the ecosystem back to where it was. You can never rebuild what you've lost. You just get a new normal. There can be agricultural or fishery losses, as Kim mentioned, with the bass eating local fish. Uh, wall lizards are now eating raspberries, blackberries, blueberries. They will also eat tomatoes. So there's, there's even, an, there are even an agricultural pest here as well. The environment can be degraded. A lot of people like clear water when they're boating, but on the lower mainland, there are places where Brazilian elodia, which is a, it's a plant that used to be readily available in the pet trade. Uh, I'm, I've, I've had it myself in, in fish tanks. If it gets loose, it fragments and then can regrow from those fragments and it can easily overgrow and choke waterways. So something as simple as an aquarium plant can be a problem. And of course, I've got people's cats running around my yard because you know they're I think we're in the middle of the range of three domestic cats that are loose. And so the the domestic cats even, they're not most people keep them in their homes, so they're not invasive in the strict sense, but the predation by a, a pet that's loose is significant and there are numerous records detailing uh, how many million birds and mammals are killed each year by domestic cats that are loose but the same could be said for the wall lizard I and mean, lizards are if we just ballpark half a million wall lizards on vancouver island now if each lizard is eating one insect a day and you, you know they're eating more than that that's over half a million insects spiders uh, being eaten every day and there's also the mess i mean the cats poop in my garden. I'm regularly digging up uh, cat poop in my garden, but if you have lizards in your yard, you'll have lizard poop everywhere. It's, it's unavoidable. Uh, it washes off with every rain, but the next day there's poop on the fence or on your, your garden walls. So, I mean, as much as we like pets and we, ha we all have pets, um, we certainly have to be more responsible in how we keep them. Luckily, most are tropical, and yes, there are people in British Columbia with some particularly dangerous snakes. Uh, luckily, they won't survive a full year because it's just too cold here. And, it, and it's okay to have pets. I mean, I, I would be a hypocrite if I said stop keeping pets because I've had, I, I had 29 species of reptile and amphibian at one point. I've, I, I love having pets. But the fact is, once you've got a pet, you've got to be responsible for it and not let it loose. So this is my daughter. That was the first wall lizard she's ever handled. So, you know, she was tickled pink at that. That lizard is now at the museum. I didn't tell her that. But, um, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's one of these things. Once you've got a pet, look after it or find it a new home if, if you can't keep it anymore. And uh, our, as our sticker says, don't let them loose. And I guess we'll stop there. Whoops. And show. And maybe go for some questions. And... Whoop. Perfect. That's it. Well, thank you, Gavin. I mean, you answered my big question was really what should people do if they can no longer take care of that pet? And, and you mentioned finding finding home. It, will some pet stores take it back? Like if you went back and said you just couldn't keep it any longer? Yeah, some pet stores will take things back. I, I do see the occasional large turtle in a pet store. And as far as I know, it is illegal to sell turtles in the same family as the red-eared turtle uh, but I do see them in the pet stores and then I'll go back later and the turtle's not there anymore so I, I don't know if they just quietly sell them or not um, but buying and selling turtles in that family is technically illegal in British Columbia people do take back larger fish and I know I've had fish in my tanks that have outgrown the aquarium and I've I've run them back to the store and um and especially if it's a nice fish they, they're they're happy to get it because they can they can sell it for a lot more money and if folks see uh, a plant or an animal that they think might be invasive, what should they do? Oh, this, um, well, I, what I do is I, I log all of my sightings in iNaturalist. It's, it's an app that I've got on my cell phone. And you, it, you basically take a photo of the object. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a mushroom, a bird, 
it's got to be just big enough to be identifiable from uh, a cell phone photo. If you happen to have a microscope and it's something small that you want to photograph under a microscope, well, go for it. And it's a very simple procedure to detail when and where you collected or spotted the, the, the species. And then, um, yeah, once it's uploaded to iNaturalist, it's live around the world and anyone can view the, what you've seen. And the greater community of, of naturalists will um, help you identify or refine the identification. Like, let's say if it was a plant and you had no idea what it was, but it's everywhere and you think it might be invasive, you just click on it and take your photo and then iNaturalist will give you a tentative identification. It's got some really cool software that helps you ID species. And then the community will say, yes, you're right, or no, I think it's this and here's why. It's it's really quite cool. It's it's a lot of fun. It's almost like trophy hunting uh, without killing anything. And that's iNaturalist as an I for India, naturalist.org. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully today, Gavin, we've helped create a larger um, group of citizen scientists on the lookout uh, for invasive species who can help increase reporting and understanding of those. And hopefully um, also just be more responsible in terms of how we treat our pets and um, making sure that these uh, invasions that happen because of pets st stops. That is something that it feels like we can all control and contribute to. So thank you very much for that, Gavin, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. RBCM at Home takes place every Tuesday and Thursday at noon. You can join us this Thursday with the Curator of Paleontology, Dr. Victoria Arbor, and three of her volunteers, and they're going to talk about some of their work on a recent large collection of fossils. If you have young people in your lives, let them know about RBCM at Home on Wednesdays at, sorry, RBCM at Home Kids. That's on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Those sessions feature a museum educator and staff member sharing activities that you can do at home. Also on Wednesdays, we have RBCM outside at 2 p.m. Links for all of these programs are posted on the museum's website. So again, thank you for including us in your screen time and keep taking care of one, one another. Thank you.